So thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I'm going to share with you a text that's very fresh. I literally sent the draft to the designers to be laid out this morning. I'm actually weirdly nervous, maybe because it's so new. So um, this is going to be published in Monday Art Journal, which is published out of the Jacob Lawrence Gallery at the University of Washington. And the issue is edited by the artist Danny Giles. So he asked me if I wanted to write on the theme uh, and I was like, ah, there is something that I've been trying to write for years. So I finally did it. <laughs> it's called, Why I Don't Talk About the Body, a polemic. How we speak matters because the language we use shapes how we understand the world. Language is also viral. How we talk transfers to others in the communities we participate in and we take up the speech patterns of others, often without realizing it. Over the last several years, I've been focused on a particular turn of phrase widely used in the English-speaking art world, the body. I'm not referring to any possible use of the combination of these two words. I'm focused on the way this term gets used to mean something akin to bodies in general, as in, quote, the creation of objects and scenes that are intimately connected to the body or known for his, paint, for his drawings, paintings, and sculptures that explore identity, the body, and masculinity. These examples and countless others substitute a multiplicity of possible bodies with this singularized concept form, the body. It's certainly not that I think we shouldn't be focused on bodies. I think and talk about bodies all the time, not to mention look at them, imagine them, and respond to them in countless ways in my life and my work. I think that in this political moment of accelerating environmental destruction, labor precarity, and technological transformation, we need to be concerned with bodies perhaps more than ever. But for the last six years, I've been engaged in these investigations without the term the body. The first and what seems to me the most obvious objection to this term is that it generalizes across bodily difference. Insofar as it does not refer to a plurality, it creates one body as a stand-in for all of us. Depending on the specifics of where this term is used, this singular body is usually one that walks, is of standard vertical adult height, and that sees and hears and senses in all the normal ways. This body is not in a wheelchair, not deaf, not blind, not autistic, not ill, not high, not any of the other endless ways that bodies that our bodies and senses deviate from a normalizing standard. In other words, the body of the viewer, for example, is almost always a non-disabled and typical body, as close as possible to a normative ideal body, in other words, a body that is arguably a non-existent fantasy. The term, the body, disregards the full range of bodily differences in favor of prioritizing typicality, standardization, and predictability. In so doing, it aspires toward an, toward an inaccessible world designed for the typical and disregarding the different. <laughs> there are, of course, many scenarios where we need to speak about bodies without specifying exactly how each particular body moves and perceives. It would be impossible to talk about bodies at all if this kind of specificity was mandatory in every instance. But talking about bodies instead of the body is more than a semantic distinction. A body that we haven't specified is not the same as a body in general. Bodies, plural, mean something distinct from the body, even though the individual bodies that make up the plurality of bodies are not being described each in detail. In many cases, the body, the body, could be replaced with specific qualifiers as to what body or bodies, bodies we are talking about. My body, your body, his, her, or their body, even our bodies. So though this designation might not be fully described, it gives the bodies in question context, place, and position, 
all prerequisites to an adequately diverse theory of human beings, even when this variety remains implied rather than explicitly described. Wherever there are bodies, there is the possibility, even the guarantee, that there is difference. Our language should reflect this. This critique of the way the, bo the body generalizes could also be applied to the two other major categories of bodily difference, race and gender. The bodies of the body are not complicated by the variability of identity. They are raceless, genderless, and sexless. Not only does this often end up resulting in an implicit default, default to the norm of the white cisgender male body, it also disavows the possibility that these kinds of distinctions could determine what bodies see, feel, and do. The body reifies norms in all these ways. It is curious to me that in this particular moment in which many in the arts are focused with zeal on diversity and inclusion of a lot, wide range of identity positions, we continue to use a term that is so incompatible with these investments. My second objection to the term the body is that it implicitly sets up a binary between bodies and other capacities, qualities, or modes of human experience. To speak of the body is to distinguish it from what it is not, the soul, the spirit, or most commonly, the mind. Rooted in Judeo-Christian religious thought, this way of thinking has even been discredited by Western biological science, which over the last couple of decades has had to grudgingly admit that, that thoughts, emotions, and experiences have bodily effects that are every bit as real as viruses and pathogens. And so, Though we might be getting incrementally closer to admitting that a binary made up of the body and the mind is empirically inaccurate, our language still supports this theory of human life. Further, within this mind-body binary, we tend to align ourselves with our minds. The self exists in the immateriality of the mind and not the materiality of our bodies. In this construction, we are our minds existing inside our bodies as vessels. I can't really blame us because the English language requires us to, to say things that have this distinction built into their very structure. For instance, the sentence, I have a body, while totally normal, is not the sentence I really want to say because I don't believe in what it implies. Who is this I who has my body? Is my body something I own? Am I inside of it? Am I distinct from my body? What I really want to say in this instance is not that I have a body, but that I am fundamentally and completely my body. Of course, there's no easy way to say this because even the sentence, I am my body, sets up the distinction just to erase it. I body, like I dash body, might be closer to what I mean, cornered into making up a word to describe this non-dualistic understanding of bodies. We are linguistically prevented from thinking otherwise. The argument could be made that because the body generalizes, we can respond by reinserting categories of difference. If the body is based on normalizing standards, why not use the term the disabled body? Or if the body has been historically unmarked and thus implicitly coded as white and male, why not talk about the female body or the trans body or the black body? As these terms are widely used, they are one response to this need for reinserting the specificity of various bodily categories. But in solving this problem, they create a variety of new ones. I have found that I can still speak about communities of bodily difference without using this language. No. Uh, Thank you. I feel entitled to go after the trans body in that, that this kind of body is apparently the one that I have. From my position in a community of transgender people, I can conclusively state that there is nothing in particular that makes our bodies feel or appear the same as one another. Some of us look trans while others of us don't. Some of us have what the medical world refers to as dysphoria, while, there, while others of us don't feel anything that we could describe as being trapped in the wrong body. The body as a vessel appears again. <laughs> Some of us have had surgeries, taken hormones, or undergone other procedures to alter our bodies in the ways we wish, and some of us haven't. Millions of non-trans people surgically and hormonally alter their bodies every day as well, 
often in ways that also have to do with the pursuit of a set of gender ideals. So it seems hard to it seems hard to argue that this could be the defining characteristic of transgender bodies. Trans is a term that didn't even enter into the popular or medical lexicon until the early 2000s. And it is one, and it is one that many of us have taken up primarily to access services or explain ourselves to others using the most commonly accepted language we can find. It's possible that transgender people have more in common with everyone else than we usually admit. What's more ubiquitously human than feeling bad in relation to our bodies? Or what bodily experience is more common than voluntary and involuntary bodily transformation from puberty, pregnancy, aging, and illness to makeup, electrolysis, fitness routines, and the acquisition of gender appropriate speech patterns, facial expressions, and gestures? So not only is there nothing that makes us similar enough to each other to describe us as having the trans body, I increasingly wonder if there is anything categorically distinct about us at all, except for the ways the medical and psychiatric communities have diagnosed us. The female body suffers from a similar problem in that it makes singular a massively diverse group of bodies, more than half the bodies in the, on Earth. Mm -hmm. It's usually not clear what criteria are being used to determine who's included, is the female body the one that looks female? The one a medical doctor would consider female? Is it the body that self-identified women have? I can easily think of examples of individuals who consider themselves female who don't, meet who don't meet every one of these criteria. As most people in the art world seem to believe in the existence of transgender people, this belief should certainly complicate our ability to use this term since transgender women's bodies don't do many of these things and transgender men's bodies often do. But of more concern to me, in fact, is the existence of so many cisgender women whose bodies don't do typically female things either, or appear readably female from the outside. Do these women have the female body? How is it different to say female bodies or women's bodies? Like the female body and the trans body, the black body accomplishes a similar smoothing over of the heterogeneity of a massive group of people, depending on how the term is being defined. The term is either confusing about who it describes or exclusionary against those who don't meet whatever criteria are being set forth. If the black body is being used to describe bodies that are invariably read as black, then the term excludes all the people who identify as black but don't appear to be so. Or if we are using it to describe all of the bodies of people who identify as black, it would also inadvertently include all of the bodies of those who appear to be black but don't identify as that or as only that. So the phrase the black body certainly encounters challenges from the existence of white passing or mixed race individuals who would be wrongly included or excluded from this designation or who come from national contexts in which the American idea of blackness doesn't necessarily translate. Further, even though most people are some combination of these designations, trans and black and female, for example, these terms are profoundly non-intersectional, accounting for only one strand of a person's identity at a time, at the expense of accounting for the complexity of people's embodied lives. My discomfort with this way of speaking is not just that it can be confusing, non-specific, generalizing, exclusionary, or erasing. I believe that there is something even more serious at stake. In using these terms, we linguistically create a culture in which people are interchangeable with one another within identity categories. When we talk about the black body, we inhabit a gaze that understands one black body to be effectively indistinguishable from another. This way of speaking positions us as outsiders looking in to see only the most visible markers of difference, loading them with significance that eclipses the particularity and diversity of the individuals within an identity designation. When we parse human beings in this way within art institutional structures, we participate in a culture in which artists' bodies are used as visual evidence of their demographic categories. In what are perhaps well-intentioned efforts to diversify the artists and exhibitions and museums, 
Curators seek out artists from non-normative identity categories who depict their particular form of bodily difference in their work. The bodies of non-white and non-cis artists are expected to appear in the work functioning as a representation of an identity position. Often, especially in the case of performance, these events happen in exceptionally public ways, a performance in a lobby, outside the museum, in a public festival. This approach frames artists as examples of their demographics, publicly displayed in an effort to signal the changing priorities of institutions that have been historically terrible at investing in the careers of female, non-white, and non-cisgender artists. This strategy has several undesirable effects. Firstly, it flattens the specifics of artists' practices and their individual works, because when artwork is functioning as an example of a demographic type, it is usually not being taken seriously as worthy of critical investment. Since the purpose of the spectacle is one of inclusion, it does not actually matter very much what is specifically happening in the work. Artworks are elevated and then glossed over. Secondly, in many cases, these types of engagements do not actually reflect a lasting curatorial and financial investment in an artist's practice because these sorts of inclusions tend to be temporary and forward-facing, especially in the case of performance and other public programs. Our institutions still have an incredibly long way to go to meaningfully change which artists they collect, invest in, and offer career support to over the long term. And these types of spectacles of diversity arguably have very little to do with these fundamental changes. Or worse, they can be used as a cover for the lack of these more long-term investments. Finally, from the point of view of a museum or a curator who's operating within this body as evidence of difference rubric, artists who do not make their identity publicly visible in their work are essentially useless because they do not help create a moment of public visibility of inclusion. I'll call this the bodies as evidence curatorial model, or the voguing in the lobby model, or maybe the spectacularly naked trans performance model. As long as these institutional approaches continue, the work of artists of difference who engage these strategies will continue to be simplified and misread, while others who don't work in these things will continue to be marginalized. And perhaps most importantly, Museums will continue to cover their own asses while rendering substantive change forever on the horizon. Institutions must consider the diversity of the identities of those they include, but this cannot mean that white men get to continue to be artists, while everyone else must be female artists, black artists, and trans artists, representing the body specific to their identity categories. One primary way that these processes take place is through the, through the use of language, including the ways that artists describe ourselves and our own work, which returns us to the body and its identity-specific varieties. By describing bodies in generalized ways that rely on the most visible markers of difference, we serve ourselves up in simplified, consumable, representational bites in ways that painfully undercut the complexity particularity, and multiplicity of our work and lived experiences. This language conjures a world in which our bodies have value only insofar as they serve as public examples. This is not a way of being valued that we should accept for ourselves or promote for the benefit of institutions and our publics. Our job is to make specific artworks with our many different bodies, whether we ask to be read or refuse to be visible at all. Woo!